Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Wonderful. Welcome to each of you to day two of what has already become an enriching experience. For all of our community friends, we welcome you to the hill that we affectionately call it. For those friends who are returning, we welcome you back home to a place that may hold many memories to each of you. We are here today for worship and we are ever thankful for the presence of Dr. Raphael Warnock, which blessed us on last night at the Memorial AME Zion Church with his lecture and we look forward to hearing his message on this morning. I want to thank all of our program participants today, Dr. Evans, Joyce Newton, Berta Arnold and Dr. Harvey for agreeing to participate and we certainly want to give a special welcome to Ms. Joelle Dyson along with her friend Whitney from the Eastman School of Music which will bless us with her voice on today. Many of you may be familiar with the musical legacy of Rochester's own William Warfield and so Joelle Dyson is the 2013 William Warfield Scholarship Fund uh, recipient and many of the Warfield Board of Trustees are here today so thank you all and we look forward to hearing from Joelle. Just want to make mention that this is a week long, someone say week. This is a week, a week of lectures and certainly we don't want this momentum and this excitement to stop on today with Dr. Warnock. We want to mention that this afternoon uh, at 1.30, Made as Makers documentary by Khaled Keith Perry will be shown and then again on tonight at 7 o'clock we welcome Dr. Horace Griffin to our campus as he will enrich us in his own way. Amen. Amen. Once again, welcome and God bless you. And our pianist, our musician today, that has been with us, he is a regular on organ, and we're so happy to have him on piano today. So, now that I haven't missed anyone, good morning and goodbye. As our call to worship this morning, we are reminded of these words from Howard Thurman. What we are committed to is the effective possibility of a vital religious fellowship which is creative in character and so convincing in quality that it inspires the mind to multiply experiences of unity. Dr. Thurman reminds us that in the presence of God there is no male, nor female, white, nor black, Gentile, nor Jew, Protestant, nor Catholic, Hindu, Buddhist, nor Muslim, but a human spirit stripped to the literal substance of itself before God. He reminds us that in the presence of God, at last, we are relieved of all necessity for pretending and that we can stand clean. This does not mean that limitations are not overlooked, that sin is no longer sin, but it does mean that anything less then the very core of our being is not relevant. Hear the words of the psalmist in Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler, and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that waste at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh to thee. Brothers and sisters, let us worship God.
and sing with me. Page 540. us intrigued with what you bring to us through seminary teaching, seminary training, seminary lectures. 
keep us blessed by the men and women who we come in contact with in this place and other places of learning and other places of Christendom. God bless us today as we come to hear a word from you. We invoke your Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us, to lead us and to direct us. We invoke the Holy Spirit, you Holy Spirit, to be with our president, to continue giving him wisdom and knowledge, a vision that brings us together as a community, as a people, to learn of you through preaching and teaching and through those nuggets that are shared. Father, we thank you for those who have come today, and we pray that our coming will cause our communities to be greater communities because of what we glean from you through the message that will come from the messenger that you have brought to us today all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Bless him, Father God. Feed him with everything that you would have us to have, have us to know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Holy Scripture. The reading from the New King James Version, and the Scripture is Matthew 11, chapter 7 through the 15th verse. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, "What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed." shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I sent my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah, who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The word of God to the people of God. Once again, I would like to bid all of you a good morning. Praise God for your presence. Thank God for the occasion that brings us together on today. This is, as has already been indicated, a week of lectures which began in stirring and stirring fashion on last night at the Memorial AME Zion Church and continues throughout this week. But these interludes, uh, these intentional shifts from the uh, strong and direct feeding of the mind to the intentional stirring of the soul and the spirit by the preaching of the gospel is what this week is all about. There are tendencies in the world to maximize one over against the other, to spend all of our time feeding the mind and neglecting the deep things of the soul, or to be so caught up in the stirring of the soul that we leave our minds to dry out from lack of use. That is not our intention this week. 
We want to stimulate you on both ends and thank God for your presence. And there is no one better to do both of these than our preacher for today, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Gamaliel Warnock. When the Lord gives you such a name, you have great responsibilities. <laughs> you must bring artistry to the task because you have to uphold the Raphael component. You must bring great teaching skill to the task because you have the legacy of Gamaliel attached to you. And you have to honor your parents who gave you such a name uh, as Raphael Gamaliel Warnock. If you enjoyed him on last night, say amen. amen. It was a marvelous time and we are excited to have him again on today. I said on yesterday that our paths had been crossing for more than 20 years. But as I listened to him last night and look out at the congregation today, I am just reminded that God never leaves God's self without a witness. Uh, the person that brought us into contact with one another initially was Samuel DeWitt Proctor, who was the generation ahead of us. And then there was the generation of us, James Evans and myself, those of us who are now in our 60s, who followed and tried so faithfully to live up to the investment that was made in our generation. And then the generation that came behind us, the generation of Raphael Warnock, and then those who come behind him, the students who are involved in our work today. God just keeps lining up people to carry the work on. And our job is to follow faithfully. This man has done that. He has served churches across this country. He has prepared himself in mind and spirit. He has worked diligently to be an interpreter of God's word, to be a faithful proponent of God's justice agenda, and to be a strong advocate for those who are, in the words of Jesus, the least of these in whatever category one might find oneself being marginalized in American society. It is, among other things, the calling of the preacher to be a voice for the voiceless and to give hope and expression to those that the rich and the mighty and the powerful in this country have chosen not to hear. Prophets make people with dull ears pay attention. And uh, Dr. Warnock is such a preacher in a time when many people in power have very dull ears. And so we are glad that he is here both to stimulate us on today, but then equip us as he leaves and we go forward uh, to be the people that God would have us to be in this generation. So I uh, present again from Morehouse College and Union Theological Seminary, from the Abyssinian Baptist Church, uh, the Douglas Memorial Church of Baltimore, and now the Ebenezer Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia. My friend, my brother, and my colleague, whose presence makes my heart to soar, Raphael Warnock, he will come to us after we have heard this musical selection from our very special guest. Uh, I first met William Warfield at Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City. So what a wonderful way to tie these events together. Won't you come now with your selection and say amen as our special guest is on her way. Please uh, welcome Joel Dyson from the Eastman School of Music, the 2013 William Warfield Scholarship recipient. And as she comes, would anybody who is her entourage from the Eastman School or the William Warfield Committee please stand so she can see where her amen corner is going to be. Amen. All right, well, there's, there's one faithful soul, and we thank God for her. All right, so come right on, my dear.
Let the church say amen. amen. I feel that perhaps I ought to just give the benediction. <laughs> praise God for that. And praise God for this coveted and special opportunity to stand in the chapel of the Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School. I shared with Dr. McMichael that I did consider as a student at Morehouse College that I might matriculate here. And then I read Howard Thurman's autobiography with head and heart as he described his routine in the morning for getting through the cold in Rochester, New York. <laughs> and so I settled for just south of here. But it is great to be here with my friend and brother, the Reverend Dr. Marvin McMichael, who's, who moves with such ease between Jerusalem and Athens, who is an inspiration and a mentor to many of us. We're grateful for him and for his spirit. You are exceedingly blessed that he now stands at the helm of this great institution to Dr. James Evans, who has served uh, incredibly well in his own right, uh, with whom I share uh, an academic mentor in James Cone. Uh, to all of my sisters and my brothers, thank you so much. Uh, it's a signal honor to see all of the clergy who are present. Uh, this is indeed an honor. As I think about Howard Thurman, Martin Luther King Jr., Mordecai, Johnson, the likes of William Augustus Jones, H. Beecher Hicks, Henry Mitchell, uh, who I believe was the inaugural dean of the Black Church Studies Program here at Colgate, is a member of the Ebenezer Church. And uh, he joined uh, shortly after I arrived. And so imagine every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. I have the signal honor of preaching as I stand before one who is dean of us all in a real sense. There's so much I could say, I, I feel right at home, but I asked, uh, uh, as I was inquiring about this week, uh, I asked uh, what was the expectation and perhaps what should I talk about, and uh, Dr. McMick Dr. Marvin McMichael made it clear that I should talk in this chapel for about 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> so let me get on with it. Allow me to shine the sermonic spotlight on a portion of that pericope that was read earlier. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. I want to talk this morning about God's victory over violence. God's victory over violence. With the coming of John the Baptist on the scene, there was this sense that something new and different and special was emerging in the world. This was no ordinary time, and John was no ordinary man. John was a different kind of preacher, a truth-telling troublemaker, a penetrating prophet who had a knack for getting under the skin of those in power. Politicians resented him, and preachers didn't care much for him either. He stirred up the status quo and created a lot of trouble for himself in the process because he refused to play the political game. He refused to play the religious game. And I submit to you that telling the truth, the naked and, and unadulterated truth, in a world system built on lies will get you in trouble. Truth and trouble go hand in hand, and the man of God, the woman of God, who never finds himself or herself in any good trouble, ought to examine the content of the gospel that you are preaching. Because telling the truth in a world system built on lies will get you in trouble. Deep trouble. That's what got Dr. King killed. 
45 years ago this week. It was the sheer integrity, the depth, and the power of his public ministry of radical truth-telling for the sake of radical transformation, especially when he began to talk more and more about wealth inequality as Dr. King worked to integrate public accommodations to fight for voting rights. His life was threatened, but he was alive. But when he began to talk more and more about the inequitable distribution of resources in our country. And that's when he lost his life. But the truth is we cannot and we will not change until we are confronted by the sickness of our condition. Dr. King used to say, I love America. But then he'd go and, and say there's something sick about America. I love America, but there is something sick about America. Dr. King understood that there is no medicine without a prescription, no prescription without a diagnosis. We must confront the sickness of our condition. That's what Jesus, that Palestinian prophet, meant when he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's why John insisted on telling Herod the truth. He told him the truth about the contradictions in his personal life, he told him the truth about the empire. He said, it's crumbling. It's crumbling because of its value system. In a real sense, John was trying to set Herod free. But Herod had bought into the lies and was not trying to hear it. And so by the time we encounter this preacher in our text, this truth-telling, troublemaking, transformational prophet, was already an inmate in the empire's prison industrial complex. He is violently resistant. He is resistant, but the reverberations of his ministry still resound with meaning and power throughout the whole land without the benefit of a Facebook page or a Twitter account. The crowds are mesmerized by him, even Jesus is talking about him. This strange brother, this unusual preacher, who never got invited to the minister's conference, was never listed in Baylor University's magazine as one of the top preachers in the English-speaking world, was not on the cover of Ebony magazine as one of the top 15 black preachers in America. He preached in the wilderness. He did not have a church. He was not a part of the in crowd. He dressed in camel's hair, no Armani or Canali suit. He ate locusts and wild honey, no hors d'oeuvres at the banquet. He was not a part of the in crowd, yet the crowd was drawn into him. Herod arrested him, yet the truth of his ministry arrested them. And so Jesus asked of the crowd, well, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? Did you go to see a reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out of your way to see? Someone dressed in fine robes? No, you could have seen that in the city. But you went out of your way into the wilderness to see a prophet, not a reed shaken by the wind, the symbol on some of Herod's money. You did not go, in other words, to see one who could be bought. You did not go to see one blowing with the political winds, but one pushing against the wind. You went into the wilderness to see and to hear a prophet. God's truth compelled you to come because you know in your heart of hearts that God is up to something in the world. There's something in the atmosphere larger and much more transcendent and much more significant than what the politicians are talking about. They are just trying to save their hide. They have their eyes on the next election, but God is up to something in the world. God's kingdom Im imbued with love and justice is being revealed right now. A revolution is happening right now. 
the poor are hearing good news. Right now, the blind are receiving their sight, and liberty is coming to the captives, and freedom is on the way. That's what I meant when I said, today the scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. God is at work right now. The kingdom of heaven is both here and at hand. But here is the irony. It suffers violence. And the violent are trying to take what God intends for all of God's children by force. There's something ruthless and determined about evil. Evil is well organized and well financed and very much determined. And that is the irony of our text and the irony of our times. The kingdom, God's highest and best intentions for humanity, the kingdom is at hand, it is within reach. We can do things we were not able to do before. We could solve global poverty right now if we had the will to do so. We have the technology. We have the resources all around us, our glimpses of God's glory. Things that Walter Russian Bush never could have imagined, we can do right now. We can address the social crisis right now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, but it suffers violence. It may not feel like it, but the old world order the Palestinian prophet suggests to us is surely passing away. And those on the underside of history are rising to take their place as equal members of the human family, and all of us will be better because of it. That's what God intends. That's what the Bible means when it says of one blood God has made all nations to dwell upon the face of the earth. That we might seek after God and grope for God, and yet God is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. God is up to something. But Frederick Douglass was right. Power conceives nothing without a demand, never has, never will. So there is both victory and violence. Fantastic opportunity. Fierce opposition. There's all kinds of violence in the world. There is a violence of poverty. Make no mistake about it, we, we pay attention to the poor when they respond in violence, but poverty is its own violence. That's why Dr. King in his last days was engaged in the poor people's campaign. He was focused with laser-like vision on the vast and devastating differential between the haves and the have-nots. Oh, if he could see us now, with this broadening chasm between the haves and the have-nots, between the 1% and the 99%, or the 47% and the 53%, the truth is it's expensive to be poor. And poor people have been so marginalized, have been so effectively stigmatized that politicians on both sides of the aisle are afraid even to say the word poor. Have you noticed it's been at least 25 years in presidential politics since anybody has even said poor. They say the middle class, all the middle class are not middle class. Let them lose one paycheck, you will see how poor the middle class really are. It's expensive to be poor. You cannot afford a two-bedroom apartment in any state in the United States, one study recently said, living on the minimum wage. It's expensive to be poor. It's expensive if, if you get sick, take a day off from work, you lose your wage while you take the day off from work, got to put the child in daycare, can't afford daycare. Need to get transportation. Transportation is expensive. Groceries cost more. Gas costs more. In poor inner city neighborhoods, it's expensive to be poor. Poverty is its own violence. It's a national problem and an international problem. That's why one of my heroes is Professor Muhammad Yunus, creator of microcredit, winner of the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. He started giving poor women microloans because he understood, well, 
If you give a man a fish, he'll have a fish. If you teach him to fish, he'll feed himself for a lifetime. But if, if you teach a woman how to farm, if you give a woman a goat, she'll feed the whole village. And so Dr. Eunice said, I, I dream of a world where we will have put poverty in the museum. And we will have to take our children and our grandchildren to the museum to show them what poverty used to look like. He said that unemployment is an assault on a person's human dignity, and yet there is this criminalizing, stigmatizing of the poor, the kingdom of heaven, God's great possibilities, God's great options are within reach, and yet it suffers violence, the violence of poverty. And then there is the violence of America's prison industrial complex. Over two million Americans in prison. African Americans, 12% of the general population, over 50% of the prison population. Go in any major city in America, I've seen it as a pastor, sit in any courtroom all day long and you will see brown men and black men processed through the system one after another after another. Some say, well, they shouldn't be so criminal. Well, blacks and whites, much of this is driven by America's so-called war on drugs. It's really a war on black communities and brown communities. Blacks and whites use and sell drugs at the same rate. You would not know that looking at our criminal justice system. America right now has more more African Americans, more, more black people in prison and under its criminal justice system than apartheid had at the height, than a South Africa did at the height of apartheid. And when they get out, it's not simply the sentence that they serve while they're in prison. It is a life sentence. Even if it's a few months, our children need to understand it's a life sentence because when they get out, they have to check the box. And then all of a sudden, all of the discriminations against which we fought a generation earlier, job discrimination, now legal. Housing discrimination, now legal. Voting discrimination, now legal. College aid discrimination, now legal. But pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We don't expect you to go back. That is its own violence. So we have to get the courage to fight for our children, to fight for the best in the American spirit. There is violence in the prison industrial complex. And then finally, there's this violence in our politics. We could get a whole lot done if we were serious. One would have thought that after the tragedy in Newtown, we would have a bill. We'd be much further along by now. There's a kind of violent industry that controls our politics and black and brown folk have been dealing with this for a long time. We've been dealing with this in our communities. We have this kind of tragedy one by one in Chicago, in Miami, in Atlanta, in New York, in Detroit, in Baltimore. We've been dealing with this for a long time. But then there's a kind of violence in our Politics, a kind of coarseness that does not allow us to move the ball forward. You don't have to use bullets or bombs to be violent. You can say violent things in your politics. You can call brown folk wetbacks. You can play all kinds of ugly games, send all kinds of dog whistles. We are not sure who he is. If he's from here, can you show us? your birth certificate, show us your ID. It is its own kind of violence. What we've got to understand is that geese fly in a V formation. They fly in a V formation because they understand the power of aerodynamics. There are other birds that flap faster, but they don't go as far or as fast. Geese fly together. And if you ever look up, you'll see that there's one out front. The thing that you've got to know is that the one out front, although the wind is blowing against him and he seems to be getting all of the glory, he's actually working the hardest. 
And those that are behind the one out front benefit from the pull of the one that is leading the pack. But what I like about geese is that every now and then the one who's out front, the one who's in the limelight, gets tired. And when he gets tired, he just moves to the back. And without the benefit of a vote, without a church schism, without a war, without a whole lot of partisan posturing, he just moves back and the other one moves in his place. Why? Because geese understand that my individual location is not as important as our collective destination. So we must wage war, non-violent war, against those who do not understand that we're all tied in a single garment of destiny, caught up in an inescapable network of mutuality. We cannot have a country where everybody has to do everything for yourself. The shrinking of public space. We don't believe in public education. Do it yourself. We don't believe even in police protection. The government is out to get us. You better arm yourself. We don't have as much sense as a goose. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And so they beheaded John. They crucified Jesus. They killed Martin on the balcony of the Lorraine motel 45 years ago this week. Yet I submit to you that violence does not have the last word in the world. God is up to something. They beheaded John, but his voice was already crying out in the wilderness. By the time they got to him, he had already made straight the way of the Lord, built a highway in the desert for our God. They crucified Jesus in order to crush his movement. But he got off the cross and in our hearts. And that's why 2,000 years later, nobody sings songs to Caesar. Nobody's written a hymn to Herod. But all over the world, they sing all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. They murdered Martin. And they tried to destroy his movement. But several years ago, when the walls came down in Berlin, they were singing, We shall overcome someday. They murdered Martin King, tried to destroy his movement. But the other day, whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or an Independent, when you think about the arc of justice in the world, you ought to celebrate that, that just a few months ago, a black man with a funny name, Barack Hussein Obama, stood on Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday, put his hand on Martin Luther King Jr.'s Bible, stood across from a statue built in name and in honor of Martin Luther King Jr. and promised to defend the Constitution that once declared us three-fifths of a human being. Thank God for the president. But there wouldn't be a president if there had not been a king. And thank God for the king, but there would not be a king had there not been a king of kings. And Lord of all, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all.
us into love. 